my driving gloves were a combination of gearheads. John, the instigator. Derek, the conserver. Will, the builder. Sean, the racer. And maybe a guest. Invite you to listen while they sit down, have a drink, and discuss cars. Morning, subscribe to the podcast with no driving gloves. Time now for the ride. What's up, everybody? We're throwing one together here because somebody planned wrong and our interview guest that we had scheduled for not tonight, well, wasn't scheduled for tonight. He's scheduled for next week. So <laughs> don't know what we're really going to do. Multiple, multiple of the hosts got that wrong. So, <laughs> so that is that is that is just how life rolls. Yeah. <laughs> the intelligent museum people here can't read a damn calendar. <laughs> That really speaks. Calendars a, are overrated. Yeah, speaks a lot about our knowledge of history. You been doing anything exciting, Derek? Car wise, I I honestly got online to cars dot com the other day, and I got an inkling to get something else, and I'm trying to decide if I want to do it. So, uh oh, uh oh. Hey, it, it it's it's been 14 months, almost to the day. Wow, you've gone over a year. Hey, check that out. I think I bought the Fusion about December 9th, uh, 2019. Nice. Uh, my world has pretty much been work, work, work. Um, not a lot of downtime to do things with the cars, but trying to continue progress on finishing up the new barn uh, that's going to become my special work area you know just kind of trying to take care of things and and two little kiddos so you need to remind me that's probably mean to say here you know you and my dad have about the same size building and are about in the same stages of it and he was talking he came across some insulation it seemed to be a a product called prodex Know nothing about it, but remind me, I'll forward you the, I'll forward you the link. Insulation for less dot com. That's that's actually very interesting because what I was working on on Sunday was insulation research, <laughs> and trying to figure out what I want to use. Of course, the thing I I, gr- I grew up in Michigan, you know, and I know your dad's there in the Chicago area. Actually, for those of us that have moved, actually, dad's in Southern Indiana. Oh, is he in southern Indiana? Ah, my apologies. Yeah, uh, so he's a uh, he's a lot closer to you than you think. I was going to say, yeah, he's he's so maybe that research will be good because, of course, trying to think about how we insulated things where I grew up, I don't need that much insulation down here because, other than this freak cold snap that's coming in this weekend, uh, it doesn't normally get all that cold. Yeah, he was telling me a couple of months ago that, you know, they hardly ever get an accumulation of snow where he's at in Indiana. And then today today I talked to him because uh, I've been so busy the last couple of nights, I haven't been able to talk to him in our normal times. He actually had to go shovel like a half inch of snow off of his driveway or snow blow or whatever. He don't doesn't have a plow anymore, I know that much. But Yeah, we haven't had any accumulated snow, but... Uh... I know it's, no, it's I know nothing chill. about that product, but if any of our listeners do, let let me know. Um, I, I just forwarded you the text he sent me about it, uh, so you've got the link there too. Maybe you want to look at that one. It was something that was reasonably inexpensive, except for shipping. But if he, you know, the shipping basically didn't change if he ordered enough for half of his building or all of his building. So. <laughs> He didn't want to oh, order yeah. for all of his building, but he's thinking because of the shipping, he may as well order for all of his building. Right, right, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, well, actually, you say you you were on, uh, you know, one of the websites looking at cars th- today, and I've been also toying around this weekend, of course, with uh, two foster kids that uh, hopefully and likely will be adopted at, at some point. We've got cars that will fit four people, but, uh, you know, the, the 1919 Chevy is a touring car, an open car, not really great in cooler weather. The uh, Lloyd micro car, of course, is a two-seater. That's a roadster, so there's you know, no way of putting kids in that. Uh, the Overland Model 90 is a roadster, so not getting kids in there. And the Peerless won't be done for a while. And... Uh, well, the Falcons, it's not bad. It can have the kids in it, but it's not an old car. So we're now uh, we're now looking at probably, you know, what the next car is is 
going to be a, an early sedan of some kind that can be driven back and forth to work and take the family out for the weekend runs and out to dinner and all those good things. So that's that's my next adventure in the car world. I was going to ask, what era were you looking for? Because, I mean, your your um, kiddos that you're looking to fit in there, I mean, heck, they'll fit in the back seat of a 911 or the, the back seat of an Evora. <laughs> so... You know, they they have. No, I want a real car, John. They they haven't grown legs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true. They're yeah. But I want yeah. a real car. I don't want one of those. You, you're looking for something in like the late, on wheels. I want to say like the late twenties, early thirties, or are you, you looking early? Yeah, probably a yeah twenty eight to about thirty five is what I'm thinking. I want yeah right around that nineteen twenty seven twenty eight time period. There's a lot of advancement in automotive technology and engine development, things like that. So you really move from the cars that are 45 mile an hour cars to cars that are more comfortable running 55, 60 mile an hour. Yeah. I mean, my dad and I have a a 29, 1929 Roosevelt built by the Marmon company and, you know, they guaranteed those things to go 70 mile an hour uh, out of the factory. Yeah. Now, how often do you want to do 70 mile an hour on wood wooden wheels? Yeah, that's another question. Now, the ones that had wire wheels, a little safer. But, you know, I, so, yeah, probably that late 20s, early 30s period. That way I don't, you know, I'm not going to go get on I-65 and run up, you know, northbound I-65 to get to work. I'm going to take the old two-lane highway, 31W. And, uh, but, you know, if you're going 60 mile an hour, you're keeping 55, 60 mile an hour, you're keeping up with, well, normal traffic, not the, you know, well, yeah, as long Michigan as you, drivers that have moved down here. Say as long as you're not driving to work between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning or going home between 4.30 and 5.30 at night, you're probably yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I don't know. There, there, there's a lot that could pop into my head that would be kind of cool to have back then, you know keeping it mundane, you know, an old Buick or something like that. Uh, you get into some of the early Chryslers. You know, airflow popped into my head, you know, just getting into the later 30s and decent uh, speeds. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I, that's what I'm I, not a big, big fan of the Chrysler airflow uh, designs. Uh, I'll, I'll, however, I will say, I mean, technologically speaking, in the automotive industry, extremely important car. One of the you know early unitized steel structured bodies, um, you know a, a lot going for it. Of course, attempted to be aerodynamic, not extremely aerodynamic when you get down to it, but a, a great historically significant car in the development of the automobile. But uh, for this guy to to drive around and and drive to work and drive the family, probably not the car that I'm going to go with. However, I will say. You know, I think uh, Christine is the, my my lovely wife is going to have probably a little more say in what we're going to be getting this time. And yeah, it's funny you mentioned Chrysler because we've actually been looking at a thirty nineteen thirty one Chrysler CM six five passenger sedan. That may be one. That's a comfortable fifty fifty five mile an hour car. You know, it, it's it's one that's been kicking around, so we don't know. Well, see, you complicated things. You brought the wife into this, so all of a sudden I can see you and the family and that loading yourselves into a, a, a Scout Scarab, you know, the original minivan, <laughs> and running around in one of those things. I mean, there's there's if, what? Th- if I could own, <laughs> oh, sorry, if I could afford an original Scout Scarab, I would own it in a heartbeat. Those things are awesome. The one that's been t- really shown and touring around uh, White Post started the work on that one. They didn't quite finish the restoration. It went to another shop to be finished. You know Thayton Ogle. He did a lot of work on that, uh, created some pieces to that. And his predecessor at White Post actually built half that body because of the way it had rusted out. And Well, nobody said they were a great design, but they were... <laughs> They were just cool for their time. They were cool. They, I mean, they were revolutionary. I mean, you know, the fact that you have movable wicker, wicker chairs as the interior, you know, it might not sit too well with um, modern day crash standards, but, you know, flathead Ford V8 and a thing. And I mean, just, just kind of a cool automobile. 
kind of privileged to hang out and walk by one for a while. I don't know if I actually ever... I don't think I actually ever turned a wrench on it. I just walked by it. But just threw a wrench at it. There's a whole... There's a story about that, but I better not talk about it on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, we have to talk about it, yeah. You you haven't been to the museum since we've brought in the new some of the new exhibits, and we actually have the Stout Y46 experimental car at the museum right now, the world's first fiberglass-bodied car. I remember you saying something about that. Another car by Bill Stout. What was yeah. the thing? I was going to point this out. since Obviously, you, you're never going to own that car. One of a kind. You uh, mentioned the museum, and in my memories today on Facebook, the article really doesn't appear, so I don't know what's up with uh, CorvetteMuseum.org. I haven't clicked it. But four years ago today is when the National Corvette Museum announced that your first day would be there, be March 6th. Wow. <laughs> Has it been that long? It, it seems like eight Is years. Four years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seems like eight, doesn't it? I was going to say, it seems like 40. <laughs> seems like 40. So, I'm trying to see if the article so, actually. No, it's, I mean, that's that's crazy. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't realize that. That's that's crazy. Um, but it, I mean, it's been a fun four years. I'll say that. Uh, I'm in, I'm enjoying it. Well, so, a- actually, doing some the, crazy things and the the article was dated February eighth, two thousand seventeen, and I would have shared it on the ninth. National Corvette Museum no. names curator. No. After a desperate search and digging the bottom of the barrel, Derek of Blank, Ohio, has been named curator for the National Corvette Museum. We look forward to him bringing in controversial exhibits and irritating mm-hmm. most of our diehard patrons. That sounds about right. That is, so, I mean, they some, nailed it when they wrote that. <laughs> some of that I'm article impressed. may or may not be paraphrased. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, coming out of, you know, the year 2020 that we had, hindsight truly is 2020 in some cases. <laughs> um, sorry, bad jokes. Uh, should we get back to talking cars? I guess music, car museums are cars, but... No, car museums car are buildings that hold cars. Yes, yeah, buildings that hold cars. Uh, we can talk about those, too. So, I, I, I kind of want to get something different, and I'm not going to say what I'm looking at because I've looked at them before, and I absolutely hate them. Mini truck. But if I want to own one, I need to do it now because they, they only made them for a very short period of time from, like, 2012 to 2015 or 2016. And if I wait too much longer... There's not going to be any good low mileage ones. I can still find one now with mid twenties to mid thirty thousand miles on it, and that. And I'm just—I didn't think they built the SSR in those years. You're looking for a mini truck, aren't you? Well, I—I I wouldn't mind an SSR. No, if I was looking for a mini truck, I'd be smart and I'd hang out and uh, wait for the Ford Maverick. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> It's got a little bit of everything. Looks like a truck. Has a car name. It's perfect. About the size of a car. Yeah. Maybe it should be the Elka Maverick. No. Or no, it'd be the, sorry, it's a Ford, so it'd be the Ranch Ranch Maverick. Well, ranch, th- th- ranch, that's what I mean. They named the damn thing Maverick. Now you have... Maverick Arrow? You, you have yeah. Courier that Ford had used. And since this is supposed to be a unibody thing, why don't you call it a Ranch Arrow? I don't see anything wrong with that. There, you've got two or three really good truck names that fit the exact category, you know. I don't know who's naming Fords now. It's, you know, the... I, I think I posted something on Facebook about it. You know, we had issue with the uh, Ford Mach-E. It should have been the SHOE. Obviously, the Ford Maverick. The showy. I really have a problem with this dumb Bronco naming. You know, you have the Bronco and you have the Bronco Sport. And the Bronco Sport is a slightly smaller version of the Bronco. And the Bronco Sport is what's being sold now. The Bronco really hasn't come out. But everybody thinks the Bronco Sport, because it says Bronco in it, on it, is the new Bronco, but it's not the new Bronco. It's really kind of the new Escape, maybe. Or, no, it would be, no, 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 it would be the new Bronco 2. Yeah, exactly. It would have been better to name it the Bronco 2. It's odd, as much as we hated the Bronco 2 when it existed, it seems to be looked back upon affectionately by a lot of people now. And I think the Bronco and Bronco 2 would have been a much better na- nomenclature or whatever it's called to call these vehicles. Or completely change, you know, the names need to be different if you're going to have two different vehicles. Because obviously I've bought Fords pretty much exclusively for the last, well, 10 years. And in the way Porsche 
uses turbo to designate a model, not that the fact the car has a little spinny thing off the exhaust, but turbo is a model trim level of a Porsche. Sport in Ford is a top-of-the-line vehicle. You usually have the um, titanium package, which is completely all decked out luxury in every option, or you have the Sport, which is completely decked out every option, but tuned a little bit sporty you might you, you know, get a stiffer suspension or in bigger wheels and you know possibly some cooler paints and you know i've had a couple of the ford sport trim levels and really i wanted a uh, fusion sport when i was looking for my fusion but i didn't want to pay for it now you've you've now taken the sport name which you think would be the highest trim level and sportiest and most aggressive off-road bronco and you've made it the base level, entry level car. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with Ford. I'm just throwing it out there. I, I think heritage naming is, is often a problem. When you have something that is stuck around forever, you know, I, I mean, the Mustang, the, you know, a, any of the cars, and I'm not going to go outside a Ford lineup, but you've got the Mustang, you've got the Suburban, you've got Corvette, you've got. Silverado. You've got certain names that have been around and stuck around. But I guess when you try to bring, it, 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 let's, I, I guess for me, one of the things that has always bugged me is the way Chrysler brought back the Challenger and Charger name. Yeah, well, that was going to be the example I jumped to. The Challenger. Yeah, and, and it's just, it's, they're both, they're cars, but you've got a four door sedan that never, the name never was on a four door sedan. It just doesn't. Those came out in what? Oh, oh six? Was it oh six that the the Charger came out and replaced the Intrepid in that? I think it was oh. It was. Yeah, it had to be right around yeah, I think there. It, I think it yeah, was I'm 06. trying to think because I drove one in Ypsilanti while I was living up in Detroit and going to you know finishing up school and some things at Eastern. So that was right around that oh four oh six period. Yeah. So that yeah that was that so for. 15 years. And I mean, I still, Sean and I are Mopar people, not exclusively, but we're both big into Mopars. You still get on the Mopar pages and people are still bitching about that we don't have a two-door charger. People are still mm-hmm. bitching about we don't have a convertible Challenger either. I still don't know why Chrysler never did a convertible Challenger. I couldn't believe this when I saw it this week. I gotta Google it here really quick. Let's see if I can get it to come up. We all remember... Uh, Mr. Kevin Hart and his last (laughs) vehicle. This week they announced, or he debuted his 19, I believe it's a 1970, is that's what they're replicating, yeah. 1970 carbon fiber Dodge Charger with the Helephant engine in it. 1,000 horsepower carbon fiber charger, charger to replace the 720 horsepower Barracuda that almost killed him. I did note that in this Charger, he does have a roll bar and seat belts, unlike the, the previous thing. Oh, jeez. <laughs> just kind of, you know, and, and believe it or not, hmm. the same company, Speedcore, built this car, and I believe Speedcore is the one that built his Cuda. There's a lot of little bits of irony, and I'm going, Kevin, do you really need another 1,000-horsepower muscle car? Or maybe... Um, this time he's not going to let a buddy drive it. Well, that's true. Yeah, don't let your buddies drive. I guess the thing for me is, and and I think it was, um, let me get his name right. Hang on. Do, 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 do. Uh, uh, James May on Top Gear and then, of course, the Grand Tour. You know, his, his slogan was always, I'd rather drive a, oh, how, oh shoot, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess it up. I'd rather drive a s- slow car at its limit than never get a fast car to its limit or something to that effect. It's, it's very true. I mean, that's one of the reasons I enjoy driving early cars and, and having fun with them is, you know, you if, if you know them well and you know how to drive them, you can push them to their limit. And, yeah, you might be going 45, 50 mile an hour, but it's still a driving experience that is kind of exhilarating because you're doing things, you're, you're right on the edge of what the car shouldn't be doing. And it's... It's actually quite fun to, you know, be in a Model T that is intended to go off-road, basically, because there were very few roads. My 1919 Chevy, not really built for paved roads, but rather two tracks and dirt roads that are rutted. 
and take one of those and just drive down a dirt road or, you know, find a two track to go bombing down somewhere. And it's exhilarating because you're experiencing not only what was experienced back then, you're off roading essentially, and you're pushing the car to its, its limits, uh, you know, a hundred years later. I, I find it fun now. I, okay. I find it fun to go out on the track at the motor sports park, drive a C8 and obtain high speeds. It's both fun, but I never take one of the core, the C8s to its absolute limit because I don't necessarily have the ability so, like someone like Andy Pilgrim to take that car to its absolute limit. Why do I, I need to? It's definitely the old saying, it's more fun to drive a fast or slow car fast than, you know, a fast car fast. Leno has a story and you can probably Google him t- telling it where he's, he's out and he's thundering along in his Morgan three wheeler and just booking down some neighborhood in you know, Burbank or wherever. And he said, he goes flying around a corner and this thing's clickety clacking. And you know, he's kind of squealing tires around a corner and blows by a cop. And he goes, Oh no, you know, they got me. And then he realized he was doing 35 miles an hour. And he's, you know, like one time I was up on Mulholland driving this thing, and I come sliding around a corner. I think I'm doing about 70, 75. I slide sideways, and I coming down the straight. There's a cop there with a radar gun. I go down, down, the radar gun. So I pull over, you know, and I wait, and nothing happened. So I turn around and I go back, and I go, "Hey, you doing?" He goes, "Good." I go, uh, "Was I okay?" He goes. He goes, yeah, the speed limit here is 45. You're only doing 38. I said, 38? I thought I was doing 70. Now 38. I said, that's impossible. That feels fast. It's fun to drive a car at its limits, whether the limits are 35 miles an hour or the limits are 250 miles an hour. But more people can drive a car at its limits at 35 than they can 250. And when you crash at 35... Yeah, you can get hurt, and yeah, you can get killed, but you're most likely going to get hurt. You crash a lot of cars at 250 that aren't full-blown race cars, they're, you know, (laughs) they're taking you home in a box. That's why I've always liked, you know, the, the British sports cars and that, lower horsepower, and you can have fun with them. But, I mean, I'm trying to think here. Take my my Caterham 7, which is, you know, pushing an exotic sports car. But that car at 90 and 100 miles an hour was about all it would do with the front wings on it because it would it would kind of start lifting up because it had zero arrow to it. But it was fun, and it would grip, and you knew how it would grip and slide around corners. And I get into a new Porsche uh, Turbo S... How dare you? And I don't care if it's a Panamera or if it's a 911 Turbo S. I go booking down the you know interstate at a, a buck thirty. It's like driving my Fusion at forty. It doesn't. There's no visceral feeling, and I guess that's where I'm going. That's the problem I had when I bought a Porsche after my Caterham. It wasn't visceral. I mean, yeah, that car was great. It would travel distances. It was comfortable. The, the girlfriend loved it. The girlfriend's daughter loved it. Uh, you know, girlfriend's daughter got really upset when I came home with a pickup truck when I sold it. It just never did it for me because, yeah, everything about it was that almost I'm 38 years old with a Porsche, which somebody said, an oh, old friend, he's since passed away. He said, you owned a Porsche before 40. You know how many people want to own a Porsche and never own one? Uh, okay. That's not why I bought it. I bought it because I wanted a fun car. And it just it just never lived up to it. I mean, I missed the car, and I kind of wish I still had it because it, it, it was fun to go on long drives with it and use it as a GT car. But to um, Spike's Car Radios talked about it a little bit uh, because he's had a long-term loaner Avora. He's had to put 1,000 miles on an Avora um, GT in, you know, in a month. And... We did an interview with a gentleman named Mick Oplock, but we had some real bad audio. We're going to get him back, and he, he has a, a Vora GT. And those cars are kind of point-and-shoot. 
there's, you know, a Vora GT is still a big car, but it's one of the smallest things on the road still. And you can have fun with it. You can dodge traffic. You can weave. And, you know, you don't have to be at the that, at that, you know, limits. I mean, to ha- I really think to have fun in a, a Turbo S, you got to be pushing 160, 170 miles an hour. And you, then you have to be on a racetrack. Yeah, you can do it on a road, but uh, even... Even Mr. Morality, me, 100, 160, 170, 180 on, on a public road, you should go to jail. I guess I'm getting old. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should not. No, 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 no one should ever do it. Not even young, anything like that. That's just, it's it's unacceptable and it's irresponsible. You know, that's, that's why we have racetracks. That's why we have places for people to go out and do that. You know, and that's, and, you know, here I go, being the, be the history history guy i mean that's that is why certain drag strips certain racetracks that's really why a lot of those things formed in the post world war ii era because kids were racing on the streets and people realized they needed to get off the street to be to to make everyone safe the kids that were running hot rod safe the public that was trying to use the road safe you know the s the the scta the southern california timing association they formed after world war ii they went out to looked around at a bunch of different places found the bonneville salt flats and well i shouldn't say found them they'd already people knew they were there it's not like they were like whoa look at this great big place you know, and they discovered that they could run on the salt and do these land speed records, Gal Mirage, all these places that started being racetracks, you know, old abandoned airstrips, because we had to get off the streets. No one should be going. I mean, we've known since the post-World War II days that no one should be on the street going, racing and going excessive speeds. So, sorry, a little soapbox there, but, you know. Yeah, well, that that's what no driving gloves has come in the last couple episodes because, uh, you know, Will and I, 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 I want to say Will and I had, I kind of threw it out there and Will's the only one that stepped up to the plate and I had my bitch about uh, face masks and car shows a couple of episodes ago, which I'm hoping if you're going back and you're listening to this in a year or two, it, that, that whole episode would be completely foreign to you. But right now, we're... You know, drive drive fast on a racetrack and wear your damn mask. Hopefully people will be able to look at a couple of these back at some of these episodes during the pandemic and say, oh, isn't that quaint? Back in the days when we wore face masks and had to protect ourselves from a pandemic. And I mean, hopefully things get back to normal. I know we've already talked a little bit about the car show season, stuff like that. But it's it's looking promising. You know, uh, Amelia Island pushed back a little bit, uh, but they're still looking like they're going to move forward at the end of may and uh there's a few other car shows that sound like they're gonna they're gonna go and and see what happens and let's hope everything you know gets straightened out and we get back to it because i'm i'm ready i'm signed up to judge at the cincinnati concours at alt park you know i'm I'm ready to take some cars out show them and and have some fun with everybody so trying to check something here but i I just want to make certain before I sit. So going back to it, though, John, I, I did like I did I did like your idea of an early '30s Buick. That would be I need to look for one of those for sale. Anybody has any ideas? Let us know via you know the social medias. I'm just trying to kill time while John's sitting here dilly dallying. Well, I'm sitting here and I'm using the same search words I have used every time I've wanted this to come up. You got to stop using Ask Jeeves. You, you know, you you said Derek, you you want a car show. Um, I can't get the website to come up because for some reason it keeps throwing me to Minecraft and that. Well, there finally got me there. Drive down to Birmingham this weekend and enjoy the world of wheels. Because as of right now, as we're recording, 8.52 p.m. on February 9th, the world of wheels is still scheduled to happen on Friday. Hmm. And I am still flabbergasted that they are doing this. As I've said to, you know, said in that episode, Will and I both know the people that run the Chattanooga and the Birmingham World of Wheels. They did cancel Chattanooga. And I feel bad that I'm talking so negative about it. But as of 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, Friday, February 12th, you can enter the World of Wheels. Tickets are $17 at O'Reilly Park Stores and $20 at the gate. There's my plug. If, If you want and you're in Birmingham... 
and you need a car fix, or, you know, if you need a car fix, you can come to Birmingham, Alabama three days ago, because this will come out on Monday, not before the World of Wheels, uh, but and attend a car show. Uh, maybe next week, uh, we'll be right before we have the guest on, we can start you know, looking at the number of people that are falling. Yes, I realize it takes more than two or three days, but... Um, wow. Well, not, you, you could at least think positive, John, and just be like, we'll talk about how successful it was and that everything went fine and there were no issues. I really hope that in three weeks we can have, say, Adam on the show and he can rub my face in it and go, hey, there was, you know, we weren't a su super spreader event. A thousand cases didn't come out of it. And he can just rub my face in it that I've talk so bad about his event and i if you hear this adam i invite you to come on three to three to four weeks after the event and if it, it happened and went off cleanly and people obeyed themselves and wore their masks and i'll eat my words and say i'm sorry we should get together more often well we're working on it we were supposed to get together at the um world's most beautiful roadster show in uh, what was that going to be may and that's been canceled so we're watching and I showed Derek right before the episode that I've been talking about it. I spent another big chunk of money over the weekend and replaced some equipment, sold some old equipment. I have a completely portable podcast set up now, so we, we will be able to go to events and podcast, whether it's run up to the Corvette Museum for an event that they have or go up to Will's shop or whatever. I can pretty much podcast from anywhere now uh, with this little portable studio stuff I've, I've invested on. Why I'm on that little tirade. I apologize for a lot of the audio quality over the last couple of months. We, like everybody else, had to resort to Zoom. We keep trying some new software programs. Will and I had a great interview last week with the gentleman. And I'm Clay Milliken, six time Top Fuel World Champion, driver of the Parts Plus Top Fuel Dragster, and you are listening to No Driving Gloves. There was an audio problem with it, and I'm, I've taken. And, and in the last three or four months, I've chunked three episodes because of audio. And I'm tired. I I've said I'm going to do my best not to put out bad audio anymore. And I apologize. We were so good in the beginning. Our first episodes were great, and I let it slide. So to the listeners out there, I'm sorry. Um, most of that's my fault. Just getting lazy. And Derek can pick on me now. And. If he's still there. No, sorry. I'm looking at Buicks and Oldsmobiles and Pontiacs and things for sale. Sorry, I got distracted. You had to say Buick for sale, you know? Yeah. I need my grandfather's Buick. But I'm a little old man. Come on, don't make that face. <laughs> I was just drawing a blank. I, I don't even know why. Is it? I think I think two people that I went to college with, or Will and I would have went to college with, I believe both of them own, like, if it's a I want to say like a 31 Buick 50, 51. I, I can't remember what the Buick model, model, model 50. Yep. One of them had it while he was in college, and he's finally restoring it. And the other one has recently acquired his. Uh, maybe that's why I popped up Buick. I know I popped up Chrysler's. It'd be cool is to get the, uh, if you can find one, a 28 Plymouth, the first year of the Plymouth. We restored one of those at uh, Stellar Antique Auto Restorations when I was basically interning there back in college. We had one of those. That was a, a neat little car and standard shift pattern and all of that. It might not be a 55-mile-an-hour car, though. Mm, no, those early Plymouths definitely were not. I'm going to go out and give me a Duesenberg. Well, I was going to say, why don't you call up your little buddy that you've gotten some of your Marmons through and see what he might have laying out back. <laughs> Get him to lend you a blueprint, and you just make your own in the garage. <laughs> yeah, the Marmons weren't really from... The, now, the Peerless, and maybe you're thinking of the Peerless. That was from the connection, yeah. That's what I was, I was thinking, the Peerless, yeah. And maybe one day we'll talk to him on the, the podcast, but I just don't see you as being a Duesenberg guy. I'm not. Well, I, only... could, I could almost, I could see you doing an Auburn. And not, not Auburn, a, maybe. Not a Speedster, but an actual, you know, Auburn. Yeah, I did one of the, like, late 20s, still, like, stylized body line, hood, ones uh, not when they got more rounded out but there is the there's one specific Duesenberg I would own and only one and that is a and I'm trying to remember which of course if you're if you're a Duesenberg person historian it's always by the 
uh, chassis number. You know, there's actually the cars have numbers. There is a town specific town car, and I can never remember which one it is. It is the probably the only Duesenberg I would ever own in my life. I'm a huge town car fan. If I could find a cool town car for an affordable price, there's there's a beautiful Packard out there as well from the 20s that I would own in a heartbeat. But sorry, I'm Googling here, John, trying to figure out which town car it is that I would own. I'm sitting here thinking that if, uh, say, Mr. Leno called you up and said, hey, I got one too many Murphy, <laughs> Murphy Model J's, um, you want to come get it, Derek? Yeah, you, you you would probably not hesitate. You would own it. It just there's only one you'd pay for. Good way to put it, John. Good way to put it. I mean, I'll own any car you want to give me, and I mean any. If you want that's to, true. If somebody was giving a free car away, I might I might be able to take it. If you want to give me a Pinto, if you want to give me an old electric city car, if you I, I don't care, I'll I'll take it. Might not keep it for long, but I'll take it. Which I'm gonna ask you. I can't remember how you answered the question. I don't know how I would answer the question, and I've thought about it a lot. When you were on uh, Mark Green's show, what was your answer to his question if you had to get rid of all of your collector cars and he was going to buy you one single collector car, and it's the only collector car you could own for the rest of your life? What was your answer? Oh, I, I blew Mark away with my answer. He He was not expecting it. I don't think any other guest had uh, had selected the car. Of course, I'm just that odd. Uh, but it would be a 1908 Buick Model F. I don't remember you saying that, but I do believe I remember his comments. I still, you know, I've rehearsed and tried to figure out what I would answer that question for him. And honestly, I probably would have to, t- <laughs> I might be the only guy that would turn him down. I don't want one for the rest of my life. I'm not too decisive or whatever. I want to enjoy them all. I'm sorry. It's it's like getting married. There's all these gorgeous things out there, but you marry one and you have it for the rest of your life. And yes, I mean, you love the person, you cherish the person, and we're talking people, but it's a car. I want to... I'm I'm going to want to cheat on it. (laughs) I, I can't be married to a single car for my entire life. It would be it would be tough. I mean, it would be one that you'd have to really, really uh, be passionate about and love and enjoy driving every moment uh, of the experience. So, I mean, I, I can see your point. And that's it. Is there's a car for every purpose? If you're Alfred P. Stone, there's a car for every purpose and purpose. Some days I want a sports car. I'll be honest. Some days I'm in the mood to have a Jeep. Some you know, some days I'm in the mood to, you know, have a nice luxury, you know, like you said, town car or something, just something comfortable. You know, so some days I want a you know, Rolls Royce Wraith, some days I want a Ferrari F forty, some days some days I want a you know, a Jeep with a six inch lift and sorry. I think I, I, I think I answered the question. Mark, keep your money, I don't want anything. <laughs> I don't think he would accept that answer, but Yes, and so, okay, so I have found it. I, I believe maybe earlier I misspoke. I, I don't remember what I said now. I was rattling it off so quick. But typically, um, Duesenbergs are referred to by their, did I say chassis number or engine number earlier? You said chassis number. Oh, my bad. It's engine number. Sorry, folks. It's it's They're referred to by their engine number. And uh, the, the one that the town car I would own, the only, probably the only Duesenberg I would own is a uh, Duesenberg j295 and it is a model j town car with the coachwork by murphy uh, it is in my opinion one of the most beautiful town cars built um, in that kind of early mid 30s era so that's uh yeah that is the car that's yeah. i'm trying to that's where i'm gonna leave it right find there. a picture of that just type in 1934 Duesenberg Town Car J295. Say, I'm spelling challenge tonight, so I just typed in Model J295, and it did come up. Between me doing this podcasting and the kids in the other room both on their computers gaming and her in the uh, bedroom, I think, streaming, um, I think this week we're binging Royal Pains. The Internet's a little bit taxed here right now, so <laughs> finally got it coming up. 
we'll get a picture on Facebook, or heck, I might use it as the cover art for the podcast this week. So, you know, if you're watching on your Apple CarPlay or something. Big Franklin grill. There you go. I'm at classiccarsweekly.net. Be a beautiful car to look at. Uh, there's the RM Sotheby's. To be honest, I don't even know who owns J295 right now. Well, let's see here. It was offered for sale at RM Sotheby's January of 2016. Uh, it sold for $1,012,000. No, excuse me. Well, that's pocket change. Let me just go buy it. What? Well, no, let me change that. It did not sell in 2016. It did sell at Gooding & Company uh, Gearhead Online in August of 2020 for a million. Hmm. Well, hey, it's even cheaper now. Great. You could have taken advantage of the pandemic, but no, you, you, ha you had to build the building. Exactly. I mean, you know, what was I thinking? <laughs> you could have got a mortgage. building to put it in. <laughs> you could have got a mortgage on a car. But let's... Uh... let's... Oh, Let's go mortgage. ahead and do it's more do than that. it's well, like many mortgages. <laughs> well, it would be a jumbo mortgage. <laughs> I'm going to say, well, I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to duck out of the show right now. Questions for the listeners. What reasonably priced classic car, say 28 to 1935, should Derek buy for a, a family, family of four, you know, two small children, husband and wife? Uh, what's your suggestion? Has to be a sedan. It has to be a closed car. I'm going to throw out there. If you've never listened to Mark Green's podcast, I'm going to plug Mark Gre Green's podcast. I've listened to what's he's got to be 2,500 episodes into it. He does it five days a week, so it does get a little cumbersome in your podcast uh, listening. And now I, I used to listen to every episode. Now I listen to select episodes. He does have that question. We're going to say if somebody was to give you a collector car. You could own no other collector cars for the rest of your life. You have to give up every single one you own now. Cost no object. What car would you have? And, you know, lis listeners, um, go ahead and, you know, pop that up. Answer it on Instagram. Answer it on um, uh, Facebook. Links to that are at nodrivinggloves.com. Um, I just launched a brand new website website. Hopefully tonight, I just changed all the IP addresses and everything. So by the time this episode comes out, the new website will be up and running. Uh, it's a dedicated, more podcast-centric website. A lot cleaner, a lot quicker to interface with. I think it's more easily navigatable. Um, is that a word? But no. <laughs> Navigable? If I say it and I can kind of sort of spell it, it's a word. That, that's... I, well, actually, yes. I, I think we should just start making our own words. Well, I'm looking at a whole paragraph about your Duesenberg, and I guarantee you, a million years ago, none of those words existed. We invented every single one of those. Exactly. So that's where I'm going to leave it tonight. Derek, do you have any parting words or that before I hit the outro button? Uh, other than seeing you brought Mark Green up, uh, you know, we're hoping to, to have him on the podcast here soon for an interview. I've um, been kind of hinting at it with him and and i think we're gonna get the schedules lined up and and get it done so stay i forgot tuned. to say mark green's podcast is called cars yeah so if you want to wanted to look it oh, up yeah, cars yeah i'm gonna say that's it thank you for listening and remember to look us up at nodrivinggloves.com there you can find back episodes links to products we recommend and links to all of our social media be sure to tell a friend about us no driving gloves is edited and produced by j lewis productions 